As we start our time together today, uh, we do want to remember, and uh, I just want to invite you to, to join me, to join us uh, for a moment of silence as we do so. Holy Papa in heaven, Uh, today we take time to remember. And as we take time to remember, I can't help but think that within each of us is this desire for peace. And yet, as our history shows, we consistently seem to be a people of war. And so I, I pray um, to you, my Papa in heaven, that, you, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm thankful and I'm grateful today that I do live and serve in a community like Fort Saskatchewan, in a province like Alberta, and in a country like Canada, where there is freedom. And uh, that freedom came at the, the cost of many who gave their lives. And so we're just thankful for them. We remember them today. We pray for those who continue uh, to serve our country. And uh, we just ask that you would be with each of them, that you would be with our leadership as a whole. We pray that in this season where we feel like we're restricted in many ways. We might remember the cost that it came to have the freedoms that we have. And so just may our hearts be filled with gratitude today. May we be a people of of thanks, knowing that we are blessed. And so make us a blessing as we go about our day today. In your name we pray, amen. Well, thank you for uh, taking that time with us. I do want to welcome you uh, to our service today, and we are so excited for these next three weeks where Pastor Dan just shares with, with us some things that have been brewing in his heart about what it means to live above the fray. Well, welcome to our online service. It's just a delight to be with you today. Um, I appreciated Pastor Ken's prayer earlier. Um, You know, we're so grateful today. Everything that we have, we have received. Uh, God has given us out of his open hand everything that we have needed. But also, um, 
we think about the people who have given their lives that we might be free. Um, we have received so much in life, and today we're, we're so grateful. We're so grateful. And, and today we're starting a new series. It's a new series uh, entitled Living Above the Fray. And we're going to be investigating what God says about living not um, in the lowland, in the fray, but how to rise above it. And we're going to be looking at a few ways that we can gain some wind under our wings and take us above the fray so we can look at it from a different perspective and maybe we can become really good for the world that we live in. Well, let's look at it today. Let me pray with you and then let's start. Father, thank you for what you say in your word. We pray that you will lead us through it today and that you will make an impression on our heart and that you will teach us something that will help us to rise above the fray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I heard about a Bible study recently. It was where people gathered. Uh, there was a, a man who was part of that uh, Bible study, whether he was in person or whether or not he was on Zoom, I do not know, but he was part of the Bible study. And he, um, he found himself the first time in that study in a place where they were asking an icebreaker. It's always good to have icebreakers in small groups. And, and the icebreaker that day was, what is your favorite verse in the whole Bible? And so people went around and finally it came to him and, and uh, he said this. He says, my favorite verse is, and it came to pass. <laughs> well, people said, is that in the Bible? He says, yeah. It's mentioned many times in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. And they said, why do you like that? What does that mean to you? Why is that your favorite verse? And he just said this, when troubles come to me, I thank God that they didn't come to stay, but they came to pass, right? This pandemic, it has not come to be with us forever, but it has come to pass. But one day we will look back at our life in the pandemic, and will we find ourselves to be people who rose above the fray, or did we get caught in the fray? And today we just want to find some things in the scriptures that will guide us and help us uh, forward in this time. You know, there was a, a person who once said that the most important verse in the Bible for somebody who is on their way to Christ, on their way to believing in Christ as their Savior, the most important verse is John 3.16. Quite a well-known verse Many of us could quote that verse. Let's just read it so that we know what we're talking about for sure. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. Does that verse stun you? Or are we past that? When people are on their way to Christ and they read that God became a man gave his life on a cross and rose again from the dead and defeated death, sometimes they're just actually stunned. God would actually do that? And sometimes we get so removed from the, the weight of that verse that we're no longer affected by it. But it's so much on God's heart. And as we look at that and we allow it to get in to our life and to create air under our wings, it lifts us. There was a man who was very profoundly touched by this verse. In 2009, he played as the quarterback of a Florida football team, the Florida Gators, and he led them to the national championship, the collegiate championship. And this man was a believer. He was a son of missionaries to the Philippines, and he loved Jesus. And he never lost the, the thrill of John 3.16. In fact, you'll know that uh, football players sometimes put paint under their eyes right here so that the glare of the lights don't bother them during the game. And what he did is he put his paint on that day and then he put John and then 3.16. 
And you'd think, well, everybody knows John 3.16, don't they? All our neighbors know John 3.16, right? All our friends? Well, maybe not. During that game, people saw that, and the chatter started. And all of a sudden, you had so many Google hits looking up John 3.16. During the game and after the game, 94 million people had Googled John 3.16. Is it a common verse? Maybe not. There's a lot of people in our world who need to know the love of God through that verse. They need to hear it, and they need to know it personally. Why are you and I on this earth in this time during this pandemic? Maybe it's to allow somebody to know the secret of John 3.16. Well, that's, a, that's for a person coming to Christ, but what about somebody who has come to Christ? The same person who said that the John 3.16 verse is important for those coming to Christ also said that for those who have come to Christ, maybe the most important verse of their life is Romans 8.28, another verse that people can quote probably by heart. For we know... By experience, for we know, Paul writes, that God causes all things to work together for the good. For who? For those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And then it goes on and it says that God is taking these people and he's conforming them to the likeness, the image of his son. Well, here we are. If it's true that God is causing even pandemic stuff to work together for our good, what do we need to do? It says, this is for those who love God. How are you doing during the pandemic? How are you doing as a lover of God? Are you becoming more deeply in love with the God who made you, the Savior who died for you? Or are we getting distracted by the fray and being drawn away to lesser loyalties? Today, maybe we could renew, rekindle. We've been stacking the wood and praying this last month. I just love that theme that Pastor Ken has led us through. We've been stacking wood. And just maybe God is going to begin, and I think he is beginning, to kindle a fire in that wood and, and, and to allow it to begin burning and growing. Wow. I get excited. That lifts me up. It puts wind under my wings to know that. Well, it's important to know the love of God, and it's important for us to love God back. Very simple during these times. And what does God do? He takes us to places in life where we will get to know his working more intimately and more deeply. Places where it's disguised as a tragedy or as a misfortune, but it's a place where one day we look back and we say, there I saw the hand of God working. Just like the Israelites. You go back to the book of Exodus and you see that Moses is raised up by God to lead God's people, so many of them who were slaves in Egypt, he led them out of Egypt and he led them to freedom. But on the way, they come to a place, being led by God, he led them right there. It was his working, his will. He brought them to a place where they were encamped by the Red Sea. They had no way to go forward because the sea was there. They couldn't go right or left. They couldn't go any place. They were encamped. They were hemmed in, and they heard that Pharaoh's army, Pharaoh had changed his mind. He wasn't going to let them go now, and he was chasing them with his whole army. All his chariots and horses, all of his soldiers were coming after them, and they were in a bad place, very bad place. What happened? Well, you know, as you go back and you read the story, and it's thrilling to read it, uh, go back and do that. Uh, suddenly, Moses lifts his hand over the water and it parts. 
And God makes a way where there was no way. And this is celebrated ever since then by the Israelites and by people all over the world. The, the parting of the Red Sea, the miracle of God. They were in a bad, bad place, but God made it into a good place. There did we rejoice in him. In fact, Psalm 66 says this. Remembering back, covering that instance when God moved in. It says, come and see what our God has done. What awesome miracles he performs for people. He made a dry path through the Red Sea and his people went across on foot. There did we rejoice in him. One day, we're going to be looking at this pandemic as something in the past. Are there certain times and places in this pandemic where we could point to and say, there did we rejoice in him because we saw the hand of God moving. We saw God working in a supernatural way. There are so many God sightings. I heard them this week. God is at work. And what he's doing is he's lifting us to a new perspective to rise above the fray. You know, Andrew Murray was very acquainted with the fray. He lived in the 1800s and he was a missionary to South Africa. He was a man of prayer. He wrote on prayer. Such an inspiration um, as we look back at this man's life. And he says, when you come into a difficult place, when you're hemmed in, when you're in a pit, when you're in a prison in life, when you're in a place where you never wanted to be, a place of disappointment and hardship. He said this. He says, in a time of trouble, I am four things. I am here by God's appointment. I'm not here by fate. I'm not here by an accident. I'm not here by the hand of people, but I'm here by God's appointment. Secondly, I am here in God's keeping. Thirdly, I am here in God's training. And fourthly, I am here in God's timing. Let's go back. I'm here by God's appointment. You know that nothing touches my life except by the permission of God. Nothing. Satan, in the book of Job, had to go to God and get permission from God in order to lay a finger on Job. And God had a plan and a purpose in everything that Job went through. And you see it at the end of the book. I'm here by God's appointment. It's not an accident. You're alive today for a reason. You're in this pandemic for a reason. And I think the world needs what we have. But secondly, I am here in his keeping. I'm not here alone, but, but I'm here in God's keeping. And Andrew Murray would say this. He will keep me here in his love. And he will give me grace in this trial to behave as his child. When we reach the end of our hoarded resources, the hymn says, the Father's forgiving has only begun. Jesus, speaking through Paul, in Romans, or in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, he says this. He says, my power works best in weakness. <laughs> weakness is a time when we invite God in because we're at the end of our rope. We're at the end of our resources. We can't keep on. And suddenly, that's when we become the strongest we've ever been in life. Because suddenly we, we, we transfer our dependence on our own self and our own strength to his unlimited resources. And we rise above the fray. I am here in his keeping. He'll see me through. And his grace is abundant. It's available. And thirdly, I, I'm under his training. Wow, God is doing something here. And everything that needs to take place in my life will take place 
that is necessary for me to get ready to rule and reign with, with Jesus in eternity. Everything that touches my life, God deems necessary to get me ready for my eternal job, ruling and reigning with Christ. That puts wind under my wings. But he doesn't leave it there. He says, I'm here for his time. There's a beginning and end. God knows how long to keep me there until his work is done. And so what I can do is I know the character and the person of God is unspeakably wonderful. He is trustworthy. I can say, God, I am going to rest in your timing. I am going to rest. And that puts wind under my wings. But let me take you a step further. Let me take you to a place, not just the shores of the Red Sea, but let's go to a place called Dothan. That's another place where we could say, there did we rejoice in him. But it was a place, it was a bad place in life. It was a bad place for Joseph. You can read about it in the 37th chapter of Genesis. Joseph was a young man who was favored by his father. He was hated by his brothers. The scourge of sibling rivalry. His brothers were really jealous of him. And one day he came to his brothers. He found them in a place called Dothan. They were taking care of the, the herd there. And Joseph came, being, I believe, sent by his father. And Joseph visited his brothers. And everything that they said to them seemed to set them off. And finally, they, they just couldn't stand him, and they, they took him. They were going to kill him. But wisdom prevailed through an older brother, and they decided to throw him into a cistern, a well, a dry well, a pit. And they kept him there. And not long after that, a caravan came through and they were on their way to Egypt. Some traders came and they uh, stopped and they found out that they could buy a slave for 20 pieces of silver. They bought Joseph and they took him to Egypt. Well, his brothers had to make up something to tell his father, so they took his multicolored coat, his beautiful coat, and they put animal's blood on it. They took it to his father and said, we're sorry, father, but your son has been ravaged and eaten by a wild animal. And his father went into mourning, uncontrollable mourning. He thought his son had died. But his son had not died. There in Dothan, he was put into uh, a pit. We don't like pits. Some of us may be feeling like we're in a pit right now. But it could be the beginning to a working of God that unlike we have never seen in our life. Some of the greatest things that God does starts in a pit. And he took Joseph out of that pit through that the means of a caravan of traders, took him to Egypt, sold him into slavery to Potter, a man named Potiphar. He is falsely accused. He is put into prison. And there he had an opportunity to interpret some dreams of a couple of men who were in prison. And later on, I think it was two years later, he didn't think he'd ever get out of prison. One day, he was summoned by Pharaoh. Pharaoh of Egypt. He had heard that this man could interpret dreams, which he did for the baker and the cupbearer of the Pharaoh who had been in prison. And now the cupbearer was out, and he told, he remembered Joseph, and he told the, the Pharaoh about him. And Pharaoh had had a dream, and Pharaoh called him up, and God enabled this young man to interpret that dream. Pharaoh knew the hand of God was on him. And he says, I want you in my administration. I'm going to make you number two over all my kingdom. And for the next 14 years, Joseph was there. 
for the first seven, it was a time of plenty, and Joseph knew that, and he gathered grain. And then the last seven, the second seven, were years of famine, where they needed the grain. And this man, used by God, saved the nation of Egypt and the budding nation of Israel. Because Joseph's brothers came then, and they came to Egypt looking for food because they were starving. And who did they meet? They met their brother. What did he say to them? He said this. (laughs) It's just amazing. It's just amazing. He said, I am Joseph. Finally, he revealed himself to them. They didn't know it at first that they were dealing with their brother whom they had sold into slavery. Could you imagine the surprise on their faces when he says, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years, and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. (laughs) Remember, we are here by God's appointment. God had appointed that he would be in the pit, but then after that he would be reigning with Pharaoh and he'd be saving many lives. What is God up to? Do you feel like you're in a pit or you're hemmed in today? Just maybe it's the beginning of the work of God in your life to do something that one day you'll point back and you'll say, there I rejoiced in God. In Dothan, Joseph was thrown in a pit sold into slavery. But centuries later, we read about Dothan again. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we find a man named Elisha, one of my favorite people in the whole Bible. God did so much through him, so many miracles through this man's life. And this man was staying in Dothan with his servant, And something had happened. You see, the Aramean king hated this man, Elisha. Because Elisha supernaturally was able to listen in to the conversations that the king, uh, the Aramean king had in his bedroom. And he knew the military maneuvers that were being planned by this man. Uh, in the days ahead, and he would go and alert the king of Israel. And when the king of the Arameans found out about this, he just burned with anger. And he says, where's this guy? I'm going to kill him. And so he, he found out he was in Dothan. Wow, that, that could be a bad place for Elisha. Because a servant of Elisha got up the next morning, and he looked around, And he saw that there were troops and horses and chariots everywhere. And he said, oh, sir, he said to Elisha, he said, what will we do now? And he just cried out to Elisha. And Elisha said, don't be afraid, for there are more on our side than on theirs. And Elisha prayed, oh, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. There is an unseen world that God invites us to open our eyes to today. Elisha was a man who had one eye on the chaos around him, the fray that he was living in. But the other eye was very in tune to the unseen world and what God was really up to. May God give us a vision of what he's doing and not just allow us to, in a myopic way, look at the fray on this level and get so burdened down because God is doing something. And one day, we could look back at this time as our Dothan or our 
our time beside the Red Sea. And we could say, there did we rejoice in him. I wonder what God might do to allow us to do that. I just want to begin to close and say this. Remember that God does something very special for the person who will love him. All things will work together. They're not all going to be good, but they will work together for the good of that person. The most important thing in my life is that I could be a lover of God. How are you doing as a lover of God? Are we fighting God, the one who came into the world to save us and to help us and to see us through? Do we ever push him away? Here's a story of a young man who is walking along a shallow but wide river. And out in the middle of that river, he looked and he saw a rock. And on that rock was a kitten that was so afraid it was half drowned and it probably wasn't going to live much longer. And the young man thought about it. He weighed out his options. He looked at his options and he just really wanted to save the cat. And finally, he took a deep breath. He rolled his sleeves down because he knew it was going to be a battle. Cats are like that, you know. Dogs are never like that. Get a dog. No. <laughs> Sorry, cat lovers. I like cats too. But you know, he rolled down his sleeves and he rolled up his pant legs, took off his shoes, and he waded out into the middle of that river. And then he took a deep breath and he reached down and he took a hold of the cat. And that cat just went wild. It started to bite him. It started to scratch him. And it was very painful. But yet, he took it and he kept holding the cat above the water until he got to the shore and he put it down and the cat ran away, hopefully to its home. What do we learn from that? Sometimes you and I are like the cat. For God so loved the world that he sent somebody so special, his only son. And he came to take whatever pain it would take to save us. In fact, it took him to the cross and there he died. And through his resurrection, we can look at that place in our river, at that rock that we're on, and we can say there, I rejoice in him. That's where Jesus saved me. But am I fighting him? Am I pushing him away? Or am I embracing him and loving him? And as we close today, I just want to say this. Could you and I become stunned once again? Or maybe in the deepest way possible ever by John 3.16? To be loved by God is a stunning experience. In the middle of this pandemic, could I know the love of God deeper than I ever have before? And the only way I know that is to give him time. And this week, would you give him time? Would you go into the Bible and meditate on those passages that have meant so much to you before? And let his love for you come alive again. And then, could you do everything to stir up the love that you have for him? The book of Revelation, one of the most um, sorry passages in all of Revelation is this. You have left your first love. Have I, during the pandemic, left my first love, my love for Jesus? Have I gotten away from him? Now, in this next week, could we make an all-out effort to look in to our Bibles, to receive the love of God through the word of God and through the presence of God in our life? The presence of others, maybe our small group or worshiping, online or in person, 
Could I begin to receive the love of God? And could I allow that to become so alive in me again to where I am stunned? And then could I do whatever it takes to kindle that fire, to blow on those flames and to see them increase so that my love for God is stronger than ever before. For we know that God causes all things to work together for those who love him. Wow. God, would you lead us forward? Would you give us a way to see that flame kindled and increased this week? May we experience the love of God. May we know the the love of God in its, in, in its width and its length and its height and its depth. May we be overcome with your love and then may we be those who love you with all our heart and mind and soul and strength. Make it to be a good week for us, Father. And may we one day look back at this time and say, there did we rejoice in him. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.
Thank you so much, Pastor Dan. As we live in these uncertain times, may we just be reminded of what it means to, to live above the fray. And may we uh, give all that we have to you, Jesus, and to what you've asked and called us to uh, this week. Thanks for joining us. I will see you next week.